When a country descends from its former glory into the cesspools of immorality and licentiousness, who's to blame? Who is to blame? Well, basically, it's the common person. The common person or the leaders. It depends on whether the common people elect the leaders or whether the leaders are just self-appointed. But then it's not just the leaders. What is it? I'll tell you in just a minute. responsible when a country falls? Well, I said that the leaders are responsible, the people are responsible, especially if they get to elect the leaders. But there's another group of people that God holds responsible. And this is what we see in Isaiah chapter 3. As we look at this word of the Lord that came to Isaiah concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In Isaiah chapter 3, we saw in verse 8 that Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen. And what is the consequence of their stumbling and their falling? Well, God has removed the leadership. And he has brought children to rule over them. He has lifted up the people, the inferior, to come against the honorable. And it's chaos. I don't know if you know anything about Germany in 1945. But after Hitler uh, uh, was destroyed and taken out of power, in a, for a while, Germany... Germany, in a sense, kind of fell apart. There, there was chaos. Why? Because there wasn't, uh, uh, their leadership was gone. Now, their leader was a horrible, horrible leader. But there was just chaos. And so this is what you find when you have the leadership changing, but it's more so what you find when you have the inferior people displacing the honorable, when you have the youth or the capricious children displacing the adults. And he goes on to say this, Jerusalem and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord. To rebel against his glorious presence, he was right there. They were going through the ritual. They were having their religion, but they had no relationship. They were honoring him with their lips, but their hearts were far from them, from him. And so he says, the expression on their faces bears witness against them. And they display their sin like Sodom. They don't even conceal it. I mean, they're parading in the streets. Stop and think if you ever listen to E, entertainment, and you follow what's happening among the, the heroes, so to speak, of, of this country. When you look at the entertainers, when you look at the rock stars and the musicians and, and, and people that, that have attained, that make themselves the ones that judge another's outfit and say whether they're cool or they're not cool or their behavior or that, look at them. And you see a haughtiness about them. You see an arrogance about them. But the other thing that you also see is you see a lack of absolutes. You see a lack of morality. They don't try to hide their sin anymore. They've come, so to speak, out of the closet of iniquity. And you see, there is a benefit to keeping your sin hidden. It benefits society. It benefits society when we say, oh, listen, and this happened in, in, in years past in the movie industry. It got so bad that they came up with a commission that would review all films to make sure that they held a certain standard. And they held a standard where they wouldn't even let a husband and wife have a double bed. They had twin beds. If you, if you look at I Love Lucy, 
Lucy, if you look at those old, old sitcoms, they had separate beds. Now you see them in bed, and now you see all sorts of things going on that should only be in private. But what are they doing? They're displaying their sin like Sodom. You see movie stars and you see them filmed absolutely naked and you see them in the act, in the very act that is something that is supposed to be beautiful and supposed to be proper and is supposed to be uh, um, undefiled. God says marriage is honorable and all and the bed undefiled. But you see them displaying their sin like Sodom. There's no hiding it. It says they do not even conceal it. And so what you have is you have a woe. Woe to them for they have brought evil on themselves. This is why the leadership has changed. This is why you have these capricious children ruling over you. This is why you have the inferior rather than the honorable. But then he makes a statement. And this is a word to you, and it's a word to me, beloved. Say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. In other words, they're going to benefit from their good behavior. But also, are they not only going to benefit from their good behavior, but the wicked are going to receive a curse because of their bad behavior? So we see the second woe in Isaiah. I told you that there are 22 woes in a previous program. And it is more than you will find in any other prophetic book in the Old Testament. Woe to the wicked. It will go badly with them. For what he deserves will be done to him. What is he saying? Here's this wicked person displaying their sin like Sodom. You, you see it. You look and, and you read about so-and-so and how they uh, have this wonderful announcement to make. This star is finally pregnant and her boyfriend is so happy. God calls that adultery. God calls that fornication. God says that that is displeasing to him. And yet they display their sin. But God says, listen, you're going to reap the harvest of your sin. Now, this is not a message that people want to hear. But I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for supporting this program. I want to thank you so much for getting involved. I want to thank you so much for honoring the word of God in this way so that you want God, so that you want people to hear the word of God, to have it explained to them, to go through the Bible, a book at a time, a chapter at a time, a verse at a time so that they can hear the whole counsel of God, so that they can know, thus says the Lord. And so that the word of God then becomes their plumb line against the way that they are living. Now, if the word of God is pointing out sin in your life, precious one, then I can tell you this, God has you listening because God wants to work in your life. He doesn't want you to reap your wickedness. He doesn't want to judge you. He wants to bless you. He wants to turn you from your wickedness and your evil ways to righteousness. Righteousness means there are absolutes and you have chosen to do what God says is right. You've made a turnaround. This is what he's calling them to in the first chapter of Isaiah. He is saying to them, repent, repent. Have a change of mind. Come back to God. And that's what God is saying to you. If you're listening today and you are displaying your sin and you know it's wrong, deep inside your gut, you know it's wrong, then God is saying that he is hearing your cry, that it's no accident that we've connected and God is going to meet you where you are, but he's not going to leave you where you are. He's going to take you and transform you and make you into a man of God, a woman of God. And so I say to each one of you that has so prayerfully responded to the teaching of this word that you are supporting those that are teaching you, 
and that you have joined us in our mission to get this word to others by helping support this program. Thank you. Thank you so much. You just don't know how much we need it. All right, now he says, woe to the wicked. It will go badly with him for what he deserves will be done to him. Oh, my people. Oh, my people, it's a cry of anguish. Their oppressors are children. And, and here's that second group I told you about, women rule over them. Their oppressors are children and women rule over them. It says, oh, my people, oh, my people, oy vey, oy vey, those who guide you lead you astray and confuse the direction of your past. Do I live this way? Do I live this way? Do I go this way? Is this right? It is this wrong? I am confused. I don't know what to do. He says, oh, my people, you are regarding man whose breath is in his nostrils. You have rejected me. Your speech and your actions have been against me and you are reaping these consequences. It says the Lord arises to contend and he stands to judge the people. Now you need to mark the word judge. You need to put a, I put a big red J, you mark it any way you want. I used to put like a gavel and take the time to draw that gavel, but a red J is much quicker. It says the Lord arises to contend and he stands to judge his people, the people. The Lord enters into judgment, another red J, with the elders and the princes of his people. Now I also, in the study guide, the free study guide that you can download in that study guide, I tell you to mark the references to my people. I just color it blue. He says, the Lord enters into judgment with the elders and the princes of his people. It is you, the elders and the princes, who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your house. You really don't care about others. You care more about yourself. He says, what do you mean by crushing my people? And grinding the face of the poor declares the Lord. What do you mean by doing that? Now listen to the next verse and then we'll come back to it. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are proud. What's going to happen? It's going to be a disaster for the nation. We'll talk about it in just a minute. And if you're a woman or a man, you don't want to miss it. A country cannot survive ungodly leadership. Oh, they may have it for a long time, but it will bring down the nation. And you know how it will bring down the nation? It will bring down the nation because God will not tolerate it. And he especially, listen carefully, he especially will not tolerate it in a nation that has professed him, that has his name engraved in granite and marble and imprinted on coins and saying, in God we trust. God is not going to let a nation turn their back on him and get away with it. And not only that, God is a defender of people. God wants us to treat even the aliens, even though they may not, they may not believe as we believe, God wants us to treat them properly. He told the children of Israel, when you get into the land, he says, I want you to take care of the alien, remembering that you were an alien in Egypt. You learned your lesson there. You were severely oppressed. You were in bondage. He says, I don't want you to do that to another people. 
And so God has told them that he arises to contend. He stands to judge the people. The Lord enters into judgment with the elders and the princes of the people. It is you, 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 you elders of the people, you leaders. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The plunder of the poor is in your houses. We think of all the scandals by leaders of corporations and we're indignant. We look at the election that went on in the year 2006 and we see that there was a whole switch in the Congress and in the Senate. And why uh, was there a switch? There was a switch because people said, hey, the Republicans had all this, this, this corruption and they didn't do anything about it. They didn't take action against it. Well, who do you suppose, in a sense, is orchestrating all of that? It's Almighty God. He's the one that is sovereign. He's the one that deals with sin. And so if we don't judge ourselves, then we will be judged by God. So he says, it is you who have devoured the vineyard, the plunder of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people and grinding the face of the poor declares the Lord of hosts? What do you mean by that? And then he goes on and he tells us what is going to happen. He talks about the women, but before we go to the women, what I want to do is I want to take and a, a moment and read to you some quotes that come from this book, America's God and Country. It's an incredible book. It's an encyclopedia of quotations. It's by William J. Federer, F-E-D-E-R-E-R. -E -E and it's an incredible work. I, uh, I am so proud of him and of his daughter. But he went through alphabetically. And he showed us the foundation of this country through the quotes and the writings and the actions of men that were godly leaders. On March the 6th, 1799, President John Adams called for a national fast day. He says, I have thought proper to recommend, and I hearly recommend accordingly, that Thursday, the 25th day of April next, be observed throughout the United States of America as a day of solemn humiliation, fasting, and prayer. That the citizens on that day abstain as far as may be from their secular occupation and devote the time to attend to the sacred duties of religion in public and in private, that they call to mind our numerous offenses against the Most High God, confessing them before Him with the sincerest penitence, implore His pardoning mercy through the great Mediator and Redeemer for our past transgressions, that through the grace of His Holy Spirit, we may be disposed and enabled to yield a more suitable obedience to his righteous requisitions in time to come, that he would interpose, he would intervene to arrest the progress of impiety and licentiousness in principle and practice so offensive to himself and so ruinous to mankind that he would make us deeply sensible that righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. That was President John Adams. Then you have Samuel Adams. And Samuel Adams, at the Declaration of the Independence, said this, We have this day restored the sovereign to whom all men ought to be obedient. He reigns in heaven from the rising to the setting of his sun. Let his kingdom come. Then you come to the governor. This was John Winthrop, and he was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He was elected 12 consecutive times, which tells you something about the people that he ruled over. And this is what he wrote to his wife. Be of good comfort. 
The hardest that can come can shall be a means to mortify this body of corruption, which is a thousand times more dangerous to us than any outward tribulation, and to bring us into nearer communion with our Lord Jesus Christ and more assurance of his kingdom. He said, as he wrote this under the Constitution of the New England Confederation, whereas we all came to these parts of America with the same end and aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel, therefore with purities and peace and for preserving and propagating the truth and liberties of the gospel. They were the ones that guaranteed the freedom of religion to all men, which means in this country that you can worship any God you want, but you can't stop the worship of Christianity or the one and only true God. Dr. James D. Kennedy, in reading over the Constitution of our 50 states, I discovered something which some of you may not know. There is in all 50 constitutions, without exception, an appeal or a prayer to the almighty God of the universe. Through all 50 state constitutions, without exception, there runs the same appeal and reference to God, who is the creator of our liberties and the preserver of our freedoms. This, beloved, is godly leadership. And that's why God blessed this country but he's not going to bless it if we continue living the way we've been living. Listen to what he says, because he moves then to the women. Because the daughters of Zion are proud, and they walk with heads held high and seductive eyes, going along with mincing steps, mincing steps and tinkle their bangles on their feet. Therefore, the Lord will afflict the scalp of the daughters of Zion with scabs, and the Lord will make their foreheads bare. In that day, the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets. And then he describes all the things of their finery he's going to take away. And he says, it will come about instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. Instead of a belt, a rope. Instead of well-set hair, a plucked out scalp. Instead of fine clothes, a donning of sackcloth and a branding instead of beauty. Your men will fall by the sword and your mighty ones in battle. You women that are so self-absorbed with the way you look and with the possessions you have instead of the high calling as women are going to lead your men into battle and most of them will be lost. Your mighty ones will fall in battle. In her gates she will lament and mourn. Deserted she will sit on the ground. Seven women will go to one man because there will be such a shortage of men when God judges that nation and they'll say, I'll provide my own food. I'll provide my own cloak. Please just let me have your name. They want the protection of a man, but the man is gone because God has judged. Oh, beloved, may we listen carefully to the word of the Lord. What is our precept for life today? I believe it's this. I believe that you and I, precious one, need to understand what it means to be a child of God. I believe we need to understand that God is God and there is no other. And he is to be honored as God. And if we're going to honor him as God, then we're not going to fear the face of man. But whatever God says, that's what we are going to stand by. And that's what we're going to live by. So what you see is you see in Isaiah, you see these people that turned against God and against his commandments because they were more occupied with self. 
the leaders were occupied with themselves and the women were occupied with themselves. And consequently, God had to come along and judge that nation. God is going to have to judge America. What can you and I do? It's to become a man, a woman who knows their God and who stands for him, who lets your voice be heard, who does not fear man, but fears God, who is not embarrassed to be counted on the side of God. I look at dear Jim Dobson and I look at, at uh, James Kennedy and I look at others who are fighting for the survival of this nation. And my mind goes back to people like this. George Washington said this, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. God help us by helping you stand for Him. Thank you for watching today. To order your copy of today's program, log on to our website at preceptsforlife.com. Join us for our next program as Kay shares more Precepts for Life. God is going to have to judge America. What can you and I do? It's to become a man, a woman who knows their God and who stands for him, who lets your voice be heard, who does not fear man, but fears God. Join us for our next program as we discover more Precepts for Life.